afternoon. Welcome to Drop's second live event. The response we received from the last event was incredible, so we want to start out by thanking you for that. We hope that this one is just as informative and engaging. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Jeff Steiner, and I'll be your host. Throughout this live event, we're going to be hearing from a few of the people who make Drop possible. We'll start in just a few moments with Mike McNall, our Director of Commercial Products. Mike will walk us through the process of sizing commercial jobs and making sure that we collect all the required information so that we can provide the customer with the best equipment for their application. After that, we'll go over to our test lab at our newly renovated Ohio Street facility. This building now houses our R&D, engineering, and valve building departments, and it allows for plenty of room for expansion as we continue to grow our product line. Patrick Frazier, one of our lead drop engineers, will be walking us through the benefits of the commercial drop control valve, along with the ease of installation and setup of one of these valves. Bill Chandler will be up next. As many of you may already know, Bill is the visionary behind drop. And in his segment, Bill will talk to us about the story of drop, how it came to be, and how we plan to continue to revolutionize our industry. Mike will come back after that to talk to us about some common field troubleshooting issues. Finally, what everyone's here for will be the live Q&A. This was everyone's favorite part last time, so we brought it back. We loved answering your questions during last event, and so now is your chance to send in even more. Text your questions to 419-210-5001. We're not accepting phone calls at this number, so make sure you send a text. If you'd like, include your name and where you're watching from in the text, so we can give you a shout out. We're ready to take your questions now, so once again, the phone number is 419-210-5001. When we receive your question, our production team will take a look at it and forward it to me to ask our panel. We're so excited to get this event started, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike McNall, our Director of Commercial Products. Mike, take it away. Greetings. We are now gonna talk about pain-free sizing your new commercial water treatment system. We want to make this as easy as possible and make sure that the correct equipment is installed so we need some information going in. We need to know what's the end goal, how much water are they using both in gallons per minute and gallons per day, and what are the characteristics of the water that your customer wants to have removed. So we'll start with an untreated water sample being sent to us. Be sure and mark commercial on your submitted paperwork. And if the water has a rotten egg smell, hydrogen sulfide or sulfur, you'll need to do the test for that on site and let me know what the parts per million results are. Also, we need to know whether this is city water or is it a private well. If it is a private well, then what's the gallons per minute pumping rate? And if it's city water, what's the size of the main coming in from the street? Is this water going to be used for irrigation? If so, then they will obviously use much more than a typical installation, so we'll need to know that information also. Is the water going to be needed 24 seven, or is there a downtime in the middle of the night when we can do backwash and rinse and regeneration? Is our equipment always going to be under pressure, or is this a pump and dump? where we are treating the water at a lower flow rate directly from the well, dumping it into an atmospheric holding tank, and then there would be a repressurization boost pump and pressure tank to send the water out to service. If that's the case, then we will have to tee in after their pressure tank with a check valve to run a line back to our equipment so that when it goes into regeneration, there's always water under pressure. Don't worry about the complexity of this. We'll include drawings with all of our equipment that plainly shows how these lines need to be run. Also, for all water treatment installations, you must install a vacuum breaker. Typically, it's installed very near the outlet of the control valve. These are most critical pieces of equipment to protect the system from a catastrophic failure resulting from a leak in a pipe somewhere away from our equipment. We just had a call today from a dairy farm where they had a pipe burst down in the well, water drained back, sucked water out of the filter tank, and it imploded due to the vacuum. So you need to protect the equipment with that vacuum breaker. Other things to consider for the installation would be whether or not they would benefit from a new ProPlex progressive flow system. 
Drop has its own version of this that will be discussed later in the program, but these are very popular systems for large homes and other larger use applications like hospitals, hotels, nursing homes, things like that. But again, there will be more information later. Some final thoughts when we're talking about having a trouble-free installation of commercial equipment. Make sure that there is a door big enough to get the large tanks inside. Also, check ceiling space. It's embarrassing, but it does happen where equipment gets installed to a job site and they cannot get it in the room that they want it to. If that's the case where you have a narrow door or low ceiling, let us know the dimensions and we'll be happy to custom engineer a solution for you. Once you know all this information and provided it to us, we will be able to offer up to you a water treatment solution that will give you a happy as possible customer. Thanks, Mike. As we move forward with this event, we want to talk to you about the more in-depth technical features of the Drop Commercial softener and filter valves. Patrick, one of Drop's engineers, is down in the lab over at Ohio Street. He'll be talking to you about these technical features and demoing a functioning system. Patrick, what do you got for us? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome to our research lab here at the Ohio Street Building. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm an engineer here at CSI and Drop. And I would like to show you our CS125 and 150 filter and softener valves. Uh, we're going to review the installation and service of these valves. Uh, the CS125 is a two-inch tank base with one and a quarter inch NPT inlet and outlet. The CS150 is a four-inch tank base with a one and a half inch inlet and outlet. On the 125, the outlet is at the back and there's an optional bypass module that can be installed on it. Um, both of them, you can use these uh, available elbows that will allow you to change the direction of the inlet and outlet. So if you have a 150 and the inlet and outlet is not from the side, but rather from the back or the top, you can simply adapt them with those. Both of these valves are available uh, with bypassing or non-bypassing pistons. For a single tank application, the bypassing piston is necessary so that surface water is available during the regeneration. Uh, for a multi-tank application, you want to use non-bypassing pistons so that only the tanks that are in service are providing surface water. Um, both valves use the same 1 inch NPT drain line and 3 8 inch push connect brine line. So those parts are interchangeable between the valves. Um, the CS150 is going to soon be available in a bottom of the tank oxidizing filter configuration we're calling the drop kick. Uh, the advantage it provides is that you can uh, drain with gravity alone. There's no venturi or drive water for aerating the tank. Uh, greater efficiency, both water and time. Uh, we're going to be doing a live event regarding the drop kick next month, so uh, keep looking out for information about that. Next, let's talk about installing our CS150 valve. Um, first thing you're going to do is prepare your tank, distributor, riser, and media, just as you normally do. Then you can take the valve, thread it onto the tank. I've got a tank base here to stand in. Once the O-ring makes contact, you just need to hand tighten it, just another eighth of a turn or so. You can then rock the tank and center it and align it to the plumbing that you're going to be installing. You're going to thread the inlet and outlet connectors, which are annular O-ring seals. So they really only need to be made up finger tight, no tools required. Connect your inlet and outlet plumbing. If you are using a aerating filter or a softener configuration, instead of a plug in the brine line, there will be a 3 8 inch push connect connector. And to connect the brine line, you simply need to make sure that it inserts approximately one inch to make it past the O-ring, and it will be fully watertight. 
to remove, there is a locking ring. Remove the locking ring, depress the retainer collar, and the tube will come right out. The drain line for both valves is a one inch MPT connector. So you simply make that up. Again, it's an annular O-ring seal, so this only needs to be finger tight, no tools required. And at this point in time, the plumbing is complete and we're going to connect the valve to our drop hub. Once the valve is installed, the next step is to add it to the drop hub. The drop hub is the master controller for any multi-device system. And they communicate with the valves wirelessly, so there are no wires necessary between the valves or between the valves and the master controller. So to start the setup, we're going to connect to the drop hub with the app, and it's going to ask me to pair with the hub, which proves that I have physical access to it for security. And it's going to tell me that the next step is to add devices. So I'm going to say, go ahead and add devices. It's going to give me an overview of how to do it. And all it requires is to turn on the add device components mode. The light on the drop hub turns white to indicate it is in pairing mode. And then take the provided power supply with the valve plug it in and within a few seconds it is connected to the hub and ready to go. Once you have connected the, uh, the valve to the hub you want to visit the device in the app so I'm going to choose this softener. You go to the advanced page and you can review uh, all the step times to make sure that they're appropriate for the application. You can also adjust the brine refill time which is going to uh, set basically your salt dose. So if I choose a four minute, or five, say a five minute refill time, we can see that the salt dose used per regen is now 45 pounds. Um, for a commercial valve, you want to make sure that the valve type in the unit settings matches the valve type that's been installed, either CS125 or 150. The only difference it makes is that because of the plumbing differences and the size of the inlet and outlet, the meter profile is different for those two valves. Once the valve has been added to the drop hub, you're going to basically continue the installation just as you would for any normal typical softener or filter system. Um, the advantage of using drop is that you can use the app to send the valve to a specific position uh, to aid in the setup. So to begin, I'm going to start a regeneration and the valve is going to move to the backwash position. Once the valve reaches the backwash position, you can open the inlet and start to flood the tank. At this point, what you do is going to be dependent on the type of media or the application uh, that you're installing. Some medias need to soak, some do not. And you can use the app to select uh, a next regeneration step. So if you need to, after backwashing, go immediately to rapid rinse, and just tell the app that that's the position you want the valve to be in. So at this point, you'll continue with your typical startup procedure, such as drawing sanitizer from the brine tank and finish the forward rinse. Drop makes the installation easy because you can use the app to control the valve and send it to any position you need to during the installation. Um, you also don't need to be up on a ladder or messing with wires and cables while you're doing it. Not only is the installation and configuration of the drop system simple, but service is simple as well. So I'd like to do a complete teardown of this valve just to show you how easy it is. The inlet and outlet are both quick connects to easily separate the valve from the plumbing. The drain line is also a quick connect. The meter is attached with a inline barrel connector that can be easily removed. Spin off the retaining nut. And the meter pops right out. The brine connection is held in place by a simple C connector and an annular O-ring seals it in position. The injector and uh, screen are easily removed as one unit for inspection, service, or replacement. The drain line flow control 
In the drain is an annular O-ring sealed module that can be easily removed and serviced. Moving to the front of the valve, the slide cover comes off very easily. It is a weather resistant configuration. The remainder of the cover comes off with two clips. The circuit board can be freed from the back plate by simply connecting two, disconnecting two wires. The motor plate comes off with the circuit board attached, can be set aside. And from this point forward, the piston can be easily removed for inspection or replacement using only simple tools, uh, such as your Phillips screwdriver. Uh, I'm gonna save a little bit of time and use a drill driver. So having removed the piston, I can now service it or inspect it, replace it as necessary. And the seal and spacer stack can be removed as a single unit for inspection or replacement. And at this point, the valve is completely disassembled. So to put it back together, I'm gonna to start by noting that there's a flat spot on the seal and spacer stack that indexes on a ramp on the inside. The ramp is on the left side. I'm gonna place the seal and spacer stack so that the detent is intentionally down and then just simply rotate clockwise until it locks into place. Replace the piston and begin replacing the screws. After all the screws are started, I'm gonna start walking around in a star pattern, evenly tightening. Once all the screws are installed, I'm gonna use a hand driver just to confirm that each have been torqued down completely. And when I'm done with this, I'm gonna inspect the back of the valve plate and simply ensure that there is no gap between the motor back plate and the valve body. To reassemble the motor plate, I'm gonna insert the meter wire and the power wire through their respective holes. Simply align the plate, lock it into place. I can then reconnect the power and meter wires that I removed previously. And the circuit board snaps into place. Reapply the front housing and cover. And that completes the assembly of the front of the valve. So then we can move back to the back. I'm gonna reinsert the drain line flow control and the drain line quick connect fitting. Reinsert the meter and its locking ring. Reconnect the meter to its barrel connector and secure it with the lock ring. We're going to reinsert the injector into the housing and secure it with its clip. And replace the grind line secured with its clip. I'd like to demonstrate the drop triplex that we have set up here in our lab. Uh, we have three CS150 valves set up on these tanks. We see that this unit with the green lights is in service. The other two units are in standby at the moment. The drop hub is coordinating all the movement between the valves and making sure that only one tank can be in regeneration at any given point in time. So if I begin a regeneration on this tank that's in service, what we're gonna see is it will move to standby while this unit moves to service take its place. The regeneration then begins and the hub is coordinating the entire thing. So if I start the regeneration, 
we see tank number one is moving into service. Once it reaches the service position, the tank that I told to regenerate is going to move to standby. And once it's in standby, the regeneration will begin. Wasn't that great? When you get to see these products working seamlessly, it's truly something special. Drop is a relatively new product line from CSI. We began working on it about 10 years ago. Bill Chandler, the visionary behind Drop, is going to take us on a journey through the creation of Drop and then walk us through the numerous technical innovations that were required to make Drop possible. I want to talk about the real genius around the new commercial initiative at CSI. As we walk through this, I hope you can see why this is not just another valve. 10 years ago, I woke up one morning and began to map out a vision of how we could bring a totally new concept of control to our industry. We named it the Buddy System because all the units would work together on a common data rail. We imagined the most advanced water treatment product that our industry had ever seen. So as we began to file patents, we called it water management because it was so much more than just a water softener. To take on such a large project, Aaron laid out the steps into a mind map, which looks similar to an NCAA playoff chart, starting with lots of tasks and hopefully ending in a cool product. Early into the project, we just figured we would build it on the current wired platform called Modbus which has a common rail between all the products that the data rides on. When we stepped back, we looked at the complete landscape. It looked like we had not considered other things that we now saw as issues. You're still gonna need to run wires that can come loose or even over time corrode. Still need to climb a ladder to program valves. Still need to mount and wire some kind of main control box. After much consideration, the solution was clear, but the task was huge. Here we go. We had to first design our own proprietary local area wireless network. Big task. Work out a gateway to the Internet of Things. Communicate with Android or Apple smart devices so that every user has the best interface that will be future-proof right in their pocket. Once that was working, we went into our development lab and began running a range of existing valves on our new platform. At first, this seemed simple. We just joined Venture with an existing company and run their valve on the state-of-the-art network. Quickly, we realized that even valves considered to be best in the industry still lacked what we needed for the ultimate water system. Internally, our new valve needed bypass treatment remotely, have a non-bypass function during regeneration, have a shutoff position allowing both system shutoff and the ability for the valve to be in standby mode waiting to jump in. All without any external valves, meters, plumbing, or wiring. About this time we decided to add Bluetooth to our existing signature series to see just how our customers would handle this kind of new method of human machine interface HMI. Wow. It was adopted quickly and people loved it. Most stopped using buttons altogether. That brings us to today. The new drop commercial line is born. With many patents, today the line is all Norel plastic, inch and a quarter, an inch and a half plumbing, and this summer we'll be joined by a two inch valve. Also, later this summer, all the data in the app will be accessible through our web browser app, allowing you to monitor all your drop systems from one location in the browser. In commercial treatment, a phenomenon known as channeling often occurs when one tank has to handle a broad range of flow rates. In this example, the theoretical 270,000 grains per gallon is split up over three tanks. If this was in one tank, channeling could, could occur, and that's when the velocities are too low 
to go through the tank and actually treat the water. By, by breaking this up into three separate units, the ProPlex system handles this flawlessly. In this example, three drop four cubic foot water softeners are installed utilizing the ProPlex technology. As you can see, the theoretical capacity of each tank is around 90,000 grains. While the demand for water is under 20 gallons a minute, the lead tank's handling the flow. However, when the demand for water exceeds the adjustable threshold, the second tank is brought online, bringing the peak flow ability of the system up to 40 gallons a minute. This is all managed within the control valves, so no additional external valving is required to take tanks on and offline. In this example, the demand for water has exceeded 40 gallons per minute, requiring the third tank to come online. So now all three tanks are on to meet the current service peak. This application has a lot of variation in the water flow. So as you'll notice, the third line is taken offline, followed by the second, and so on as it continues to drop in flow rate. Once the grains capacity of the first tank is consumed, the second tank is then promoted to the lead tank, and the first tank is then taken offline to put into regeneration. At this point, the third tank is the next standby tank for when the demand spikes, followed by the first tank once it completes its regeneration. This succession continues, providing a continuous flow rate when the tanks are all available for service. Drop ProPlex technology has the ability to control up to four water treatment stages plumbed in series. Each treatment stage can have up to 12 tanks in parallel. So you could have up to 12 softener tanks, 12 filter tanks, and 12 carbon filters, all coordinated by one drop hub. The valve size, tanks, and capacity can be selected on the specific application, so there's countless potential configurations. In addition, the systems are easily expandable. If it is determined that 40 gallons per minute meet the requirements today, but two years down the road, the requirement grows to 60, simply plug them in another tank, and the system will know how to handle it. With all of these technical innovations, we understand it may be difficult to know the ins and the outs. Mike's coming back next to talk to us about some troubleshooting issues that have come up in the field. Mike, take it away. We're gonna talk about troubleshooting your commercial water treatment equipment. And the first thing we'll take a look at is misapplication, which can be a major issue. If the wrong type of equipment is installed, then the customer will be unhappy with the water quality and water can be wasted and salt can be wasted. To prevent this from happening, we need to reflect back upon what we talked about during the sizing portion of the program. We also want to make sure there is adequate water to backwash a filter. If there's not enough water, then debris is going to slowly accumulate in the tank, which will end up in excessive pressure loss and poor water quality. So that needs to be confirmed ahead of time. Again, reflecting back upon sizing to help prevent this from happening. We also want to make sure that the correct type of equipment has been installed and the correct size. Again, a lot of this goes back to the sizing portion of the program. Over the years, I've seen some misapplied equipment. Let me share one of my favorites with you. I got a call from a trouble or from a job site. They were troubleshooting. They said the softener didn't look like it was right. It was a three quarter cubic foot, three quarter inch residential softener that they were getting ready to cut into a two inch main at a high school. Again, they said it didn't quite look right, so fortunately they called me. Come to find out the engineer on the job had taken the school's monthly water bill, divided it by 31 to get average gallons per day, divided by 24, divided by 60 to get down to an average gallon per minute of less than three gallons per minute. Obviously, that is not a valid way to size a school job, but things like this can happen. So back to the sizing. But after equipment's installed, let's take a look at more troubleshooting things that you may get involved with. Probably the most common one is on a water softener where resin is being lost down the drain. Now you know this is occurring because you can either see the resin in the drain or you'll notice the level is dropping down. 
Most times, this is a result of air getting sucked in during brine draw after the air check is seated in the bottom of the brine tank. That air will slowly accumulate in the top of the resin tank. Then when the unit goes into its next backwash and rinse, the bed lifts excessively and some of that media gets expelled out the drain. Obviously, this is a bad thing to happen and it is extremely common. So we need to make certain that the brine connections are tightened per the spec in the instruction manual. If, however, media is being lost to service, you'll usually start out with seeing gravel and then media. That's a sign of a catastrophic failure uh, down in the bottom of the tank. Something's happened to a lateral. That's why we stress in the instructions that before you fill the tank, you look down in with a flashlight, make sure all the lateral sections are present, plug that center distributor tube, fill the tank about one third full of water, and then very carefully pour in the gravel, then pour in the media, and the media may come in different size buckets, but it's all the same media inside those buckets. After all the media is in the tank, then take that garden hose and fill the tank clear to the top with water before you thread in the control valve. That will make startup go a whole lot easier because you're not going to have to contend with excessive air. Other obvious troubleshooting things that are easy to overlook, but is there salt in the brine tank? It does happen. <laughs> And are the bypasses possibly open that's allowing hard water to bleed around the system? And is the programming correct? You want to check and make sure that all the drop settings are correct. Other things to check for if you're getting a hard water bleed would be the meter turbine itself. Every now and then a little piece of Teflon tape will break off from inside the plumbing and get wrapped around that turbine wheel preventing it from spinning so the control valve doesn't know water's being used. So you might have to open up and inspect the turbine wheel. And the other thing is that the venturi nozzle and the brine line flow control are rather small openings. Any debris that might be in the system can plug those, which will prevent salt from being pulled out of the, or from brine from being pulled out of the brine tank, so you won't be regenerating. These are some of the most obvious things we see for troubleshooting. In just a moment, so be sure to text your questions to the number on the screen, 419-210-5001. Text only, please, don't call. Uh, send us all your questions, anything that didn't get answered yet in the program, ask us and, and we'll be back here in just a moment with our uh, live Q&A with our panel. Before that though, as Patrick mentioned earlier in the program, we do have another event coming up next month uh, featuring our commercial Dropkick iron and sulfur filter. We're really excited to unveil this product and tell you everything about it next month. So be sure to stay tuned. Uh, if you've tuned into this event or the last one, you'll probably be seeing an email from us when that is on the books. So look forward to that next month. Uh, in the meantime, check out this promo. And if there are issues that develop, we'll go through some of the things here that will take a, that could cause the, hey, how did you like me stumbling on that? Good afternoon. Welcome to Drop's second live event. The response we received from, <clears throat> let's start over. That was kind of loud anyway. I didn't realize that the good afternoon was like, good afternoon. I'm thinking out loud. This is a piece of paper that I'm reading. It has words on it. The ProPlex system handles this flawlessly. Give me back to the, back to ProPlex. Now I gotcha. Test. Yep, I Test. Gotcha now. Test, test. Allow myself to introduce. Allow, allow me to introduce myself. Let's just start from the top. All right. Uh, which camera should I be looking at? Sorry. Um, let me fix some lighting really quick. We're gonna wait for Bill. All right. Wave to the cameras. They're all recording. It's like Cheech and Chong. <laughs> That's the third well, time that reference well, has been made. He rolls out of the van. <laughs> you even got the fast food. This is unnerving. I don't like it.
right, we're back. Uh, and <laughs> we're gonna put that number up on the screen one more time. Be sure to text your questions to 419-210-5001. And we wanna make sure that any lingering questions you may have about our new commercial drop systems gets answered. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panel. Uh, you've met me, I'm Jeffrey Steiner, and I'm going to be your host for this Q&A. To my left, we have our engineer, Aaron Wolf, who you may remember from last time. Aaron, do you want to say a little bit about yourself for the people that maybe haven't, haven't tuned into the last one, aren't, aren't familiar with you yet? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, yeah, I, I'm Aaron, and I've been working with uh, Bill for over 20 years, uh, working on designing uh, the electronics. I do the hardware design for our electronic circuit boards, as well as doing some programming. And uh, so, yeah, it's been, it's been great. Awesome. Thank you. Next, to Aaron's left, we've got Bill Chandler. You saw him earlier in this segment and probably on the last one as well. He is uh, the man behind these systems. Bill, do you have anything to say to the people watching right now? Well, I was the first Chandler Systems employee That's true. around uh, 1990. And um, I didn't have to go through any excruciating uh, review or, or interview. So I was hired on the spot. And I have been here ever since. Oh, we're glad you're still here or else yep. we wouldn't be. Uh, next to Bill, you've also seen him earlier in the segment. Mike McNall uh, hasn't been here quite as long as Bill, but almost. Uh, Mike, how, how long have you been doing this? Well, actually, I'm kind of the senior member of this. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I went to school in the morning and the afternoon worked in the drafting department at F.E. Myers. At that point, in 1972, Myers was manufacturing pumps and sprayers and sewer cleaners and water treatment equipment. Well then fast forward eight years later, Bill Chandler and his brother Jim purchased the water softening line from Myers and started WaterSoft. And I worked with Bill back in the WaterSoft days and then got lured back to Chandler Systems Incorporated in 2009. And I've been running commercial equipment ever since then. Awesome. Well, yeah, that, that's a cool little tidbit there. Uh, you know, I'll, everyone here watching I'm sure is familiar with Myers Pumps and they have been a big part of the history of Ashland, Ohio, and so it's, it's cool we you know, now we are a big part of that, you know, so we're happy to be here in Ashland, uh, just up the street from where Myers used to be manufactured. Well, without further ado, going to get started with these questions. I'm going to begin with one for Aaron. Someone asks, what happens if the Wi-Fi goes down or if they have a weak Wi-Fi signal? Yeah, um, First of all, we designed DROP so that you don't need a Wi-Fi connection to actually run your DROP system. Um, you could actually run your DROP system completely without, being, without having a Wi-Fi uh, connection at all. The Wi-Fi connection brings remote connectivity and it also brings notifications being able to be sent out to users. And so that, that's all you really need the Wi-Fi for. So, if a Wi-Fi signal goes away, DROP will continue to do its job. It'll continue to run your softeners, meter your water, watch for leaks, all that stuff without um, the Wi-Fi connection. And if, so if it goes away for a while, comes back, uh, there won't be any problem. Uh, if someone has a weak Wi-Fi signal, there again, um, it'd be best to try to remedy that uh, just for the remote connectivity and the notification reasons, but it will not affect the operation of your DROP system. Good to know. All right. Let me see. We're starting to get a few more in here. Uh, the next question is, how do you decide if you're better off to use three larger tanks or, say, six smaller tanks for a system? Uh, Bill, you, you introduced us to the ProPlex technology and the benefits of, of that. Do you want to take sure. that question? When, when would I choose more smaller tanks as opposed to a larger tank? Sure. Yeah, the, the main thing about using multiple tanks is that if you have a broad range of uh, flow, uh, you get much better resolution in a water softener. So you would choose uh, in an application where the flow range was wide, then you would want to choose as many as you could practically use um, so that you um, had that resolution per unit and uh, picked up the efficiency of that. On a filter, uh, it's really more about how much backwash water you have available. 
So you use multiplex filtration based on how you can properly backwash the filter. So a lot of times you choose multiple tanks in filtration so that you can backwash it and you got to understand it takes a lot of water to backwash so it might end up being a triplex because you have no available water um, in a duplex and so on. So that's basically what, what on a filter it's uh, basically how much water can you backwash it with and on a software it's just more resolution for, for a broad range. Okay. I've got a great real world example of that of a very large home in a popular ski resort 17 bathroom mansion Normally, during the year, there was just one person, the caretaker, who took care of this property. However, when the ski weekend rolled around, the owner and his children and their friends and family and cousins, they all show up at this mansion so we could have 30 people needing water. So that's a great place for a ProPlex to be used. Yeah, absolutely. We got another question that, that kind of piggybacks onto that. Someone asked, how is ProPlex, how and why is it more efficient than a traditional interlocked system where you've got all the tanks online at all times? And this may have already been addressed somewhat, but you want to go, Bill, do you want to go into a little more depth about why that's a greater efficiency? Yeah, as, you're, as you break it down for a higher resolution and you're plexing the units, you also have the ability, normally, when there's two units or one unit, you have to hold a large reserve capacity. Um, in plexing, we had the ability to, as that simulation earlier showed, we have the ability to completely exhaust the resin and then switch to another tank before we regenerate it. So the amount of energy that you've already put in uh, treating water, you lose in your reserve if no one uses it. So it's always a guess of how much reserve to use. This makes your resolution pretty accurate, and it also does not have you flushing down the drain water you've already treated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Everyone's familiar with duplex softeners have been around for ages, and most of, them, most of us are familiar with the benefits of that. It's just like that on a larger scale and more robust with being able to have multiple tanks taken on and off. Um, uh, question for Aaron here. Uh, someone wants to know, what is involved in programming the valve if if you have a single tank versus multiple tanks, what additional programming is necessary for that? Sure. Um, actually, there is no programming involved in that. Uh, the drop system has been smartly designed to know there's one tank attached, one softener attached, or whether there's three softeners attached. And when they're multiplexed uh, and you attach three softeners, the hub just automatically knows to treat them as a progressive system. Um, and it even knows you can attach a single filter and say two softeners, and it will know to multiplex those two softeners, and that single filter will treat as a single standalone unit. And there, there's really no program at all that the end user has to do. Awesome. It, it also then, just to follow up on that, when there's filters and softeners together, it actually makes sure that they uh, don't coincide in their regeneration together. So it off offsets the filtration to a different time slot. Whereas now, you know, you have to go and manually program that. Yeah. The DROP system does that inherently. That's right. Yeah, one of the most beautiful things about DROP, whether it's the commercial system or the residential systems, is there's no more setting the time of day on each individual unit, staggering the regen time. You used to have to do that individually on each separate valve. And DROP is one seamlessly integrated system that you it knows what time it is, you know, and, and it knows what's hooked up to it, and it makes sure that they're backwashing when they need to. Um, Aaron, another quick valve question. Someone wants to know if uh, the software valves can do an upflow regeneration. Uh, no, they cannot. Um, that's just a short answer. They are downflow only. Um, and, but at the same time, uh, we feel like uh, we can, with the ProPlex system, really still hit uh, good efficiencies uh, still with the downflow. Absolutely, and I believe we've done some some research in our lab with that too, and we haven't really, we could do upload brining if we want to, we haven't really seen a, a, a big difference in efficiency with that, right? Yeah. Um, our, I, our residential valve um, is possible to do the upflow brining, but uh, on the commercial, yeah, it's just a downflow, and there is, there is not a huge difference until you really get really picky on the efficiencies mm -hmm. and uh, really trying to hit the high end 
that the inflow really helps, really I, starts helping. I, I think you're right though that with the, the benefits of ProPlex would, would give you a greater efficiency than, than simply a different type of brine. There's also some inherent risks in the upflow. If someone mm. gets air, something yeah. like that, you get a small air bubble in there. And similarly to channeling, this air bubble drills a hole and then your brine follows that. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot more expertise needed in the field and control, which makes the unit cost more and so on. So we've really found that we can really optimize efficiency through the measures we're using right now. Good answer. Uh, next question. Bill said the web-based version of the Drop app will allow us to monitor multiple systems at the same time. What is the max number of systems that I would be able to monitor at one time? And is there an exact release date when it will be available? This is for Bill or Aaron, yeah, whoever wants to jump in on this. <laughs> that exact um, date, I think I'll let you do that. Yeah, exact date, uh, there is not an exact date. Um, certainly the date it will be released is when it's done and working well. Uh, we test everything um, well in-house and try to put uh, as few bugs out in the field as possible. And uh, so it is actively being worked on right now. Uh, we have one of our engineers working on it every day and uh, getting that uh, so it'll be brought to you as soon as possible. Uh, as far as the number of systems there, uh, as far as I know, there's no limit to the number of systems that you'll be able to check. Uh, it will have, you'll be able to search for systems. There'll be some custom fields, so if you want to put in uh, somebody's name or address or a customer number in there and search by that, all that will be available and possible. And uh, so really we're gearing it up to be a large scale uh, access system uh, for you to be able to access these units and systems um, remotely and, and see what's going on without getting out on the job site. Very cool. The other thing that that will do is you can set the parameters so your system in the field can push notifications to you and then they would all just show up. Basically the ones that you wanted to see on your screen in the morning would be available for service or salt or whatever. And we're constantly adding more and more parameters that we're monitoring that would then fall into that and be pushed out to a central nervous system for deploying service people. And they would have a much better idea during the day what, what's going on. Mm. All right. I'm sure everyone's anxious for that to come out, um, uh, but it's going to be really cool when it does. I would challenge anyone out there if you're concerned about how many systems can it monitor. Um, I would suspect it probably is no limit. If there was, I bet James can make it monitor more. So I, I would like to see a dealer try to put in systems faster than James could make room on the, on the app to, I, I, to watch them. I would personally like to see them push us hard on that <laughs> and put as many systems in as they can. Put them in so fast that we have to redo the app. Uh, Chris at Johnson Supply, local guy. Uh, he's got a question saying, uh, this, could be for, uh, this could be for Aaron or Mike or Bill. How does multiple frequency issues at farms, et cetera, affect the valve's electronics? So oh. is he talking about electromagnetic interference, or is he talking about, uh, do you guys know what he's asking about here? I would multiple guess frequencies? he's talking about, um, yeah, frequencies as far as valves talking to each other. Mm. And uh, we really expect there not to be issues with that. Uh, we have not experienced issues with that in, um, I mean, DROP has been active and being put out for five years now um, as a system. And we chose um, our own proprietary network partly for that reason. Uh, it's not on a busy 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency, which is where all your Wi-Fi, all your Bluetooth, all that stuff is on. Uh, it's on its own 900 megahertz, and the 900 megahertz gives it more range and then the 2.4 would and so um, really we don't expect to be any issues and have not experienced any issues uh, with that good yeah so um, yeah because the hub does connect to your wi-fi if you want it to but the communication of the hub to the devices that's the 900 megahertz frequency you're talking about. so yeah. i'd like to jump in right there yeah. our job we recently did was for a school and they did not want water treatment for the entire school, but for the kitchen, they wanted water treatment. And then in another part of the school, water treatment. In that case, we did recommend two separate hubs because there was going to be a pretty good distance between the two water treatment systems. Plus, in a school, you can have a lot of electromagnetic interference noise. 
So we just wanted to play it safe and said two water systems, two hubs. Yeah, that makes that, sense. It's, that's it's the it's only kind of, job where we've had to recommend more than one hub. Yeah, if you're considering it to be like in a separate system, yeah, I can see how that would be a smart choice. Uh, next up, we got Tom from Northeastern Supply. Hey, Tom. Uh, any plans to have a commercial city softener with this technology? Tom is referring to on the residential side, we have a carbon filter softener combo with a mid plate. So it's a filter and a softener in one tank, um, which I, I don't believe we can do currently. There just isn't a tank available to be able to do that yeah. type of thing, right? Yeah, that, that technology does not exist to put a mid plate in a large diameter tank right now. We could do it on up to a 13 inch tank. But right now, the technology doesn't exist to do it singularly. One of the things that we always think about, since filters and softeners play so well together, that if you can do it, especially in a commercial environment, keep them separate. Mm -hmm. Because they don't require the same backwash frequencies. You know, a filter could be have a long duration, and a softener has to be more precise. So with the drop system being, systems being so flexible in how you do that, we actually prefer to to use them uh, side by side. Yeah, I think uh, right now the best solution uh, up to 25 gallons a minute would be our, our drop cartridge filter followed by a, a drop softener. Uh, if you want something backwashing or for flows over 25 gallons per minute, I would go with a backwashing carbon filter uh, drop followed by the drop softener. Um, uh, this may have been already answered. You know, we mentioned the desktop app um, forthcoming as soon as we get it just right. Uh, someone's saying, will we be able to monitor all drop products by customer with the desktop application? I think you already kind of spoke to that a little bit. Yeah, um, the answer is yes. Every drop product will be uh, part of that. So um, that, that doesn't exclude, exclude anything. So we talked about the pump controller last month. We are talking about the drop kick coming. Um, we have protection valves uh, that can protect your home or your business uh, with shut off. And all those things will be accessible through the Drop Web app. So if I'm a dealer and I've got, you know, I've I've put systems in 800 homes throughout my metropolitan area, I could, uh, I could look, I could sort by customer and see like Mrs. Johnson has these five items, and then it's time for Dave to get salt because his salt sensor has said that it's low. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. That's what we're envisioning here, right? That's exactly what we're right. On. Yeah. Okay. Because um, I, I realized we introduced that last question without really, I, I think someone had seen the previous event, so they were already familiar with our forthcoming desktop app. Some people tuning in just now might not have quite known what we were talking about. It's coming soon. Uh, look, looking forward to it. Uh, Mike, question for you. Why do I need to send a raw water sample? And how do I determine my GPM? Why do I need to have testing done before I go to my doctor for a medical procedure? I, I just don't understand. Now, it's kind of the same thing. We want to make sure that we're recommending the correct equipment that goes in and works from the initial installation. Uh, all of us in this industry have seen too many times where uh, someone was kind of anxious and shot from the hip and the wrong piece of equipment is installed. And I, I kind of like the old saying, it's funny how you don't have time to do it right the first time, but you have time to do it over. So in, in a perfect world, we would like to know all the test results before we recommend equipment. Uh, if, however, you're on city water, then you really don't have to send us a water sample because we know the EPA is looking over the city's shoulders. In that case, it's probably going to be a water softener, and all we're going to need to know is the hardness. And a quick call to the city water department can give us that information. And how do I determine my GPM flow rates, uh, whether I'm in well water or city water? How, how do we know? That's a great question. Uh, typically, we'll go by fixture counts. So we'll ask how many toilets do you have, and are they flush valve or tank type? How many labs, showers, toilet or uh, sinks? You know, you go down the list of everything that uses water. Uh, supply that information to us, we plug that into a formula, and then by industry standards, they apply a factor because they know that not every water device is going to be on at the exact same moment. But we'll come up with a fixture count what the theoretical maximum gallons per minute would be for that installation, and those are the numbers we go by. Uh, we know the industry standard numbers are safe. I mean, they've, they've applied a little bit of a safety factor there. But again, we want to be safe. We do not want to be the result of low 
flow situations at a commercial job. All right. And I suspect in some applications where you have a large fixture count, the, the pipe size even could be a limiting factor there. Oh, um, absolutely. So we, and we you brought up a good point. Sometimes if fixture counts aren't known, we can go by the, simply the size of the pipe. For example, if it's a one inch main, the accepted industry standard is 25, maybe 30 gallons per minute, depending how much pressure they have behind it. Uh, a two inch pipe could handle 100 to 120 gallons per minute. So we can sometimes use those numbers to estimate maximum possible flow rate. All righty. Uh, now we spoke earlier about if my Wi-Fi goes out, drops gonna keep working. Someone is now asking, what if my power goes out completely? What happens? Um, there is battery backups for all drop products. Uh, so certainly it'll go, it'll go into a standby mode and it will actually shut off its Wi-Fi radio, the hub, and will reduce the data rate between devices and even the, those devices will turn off their lights so their LEDs will just flash on periodically. So it goes, when, when it fully loses power, um, it will kind of go into that standby mode so it can conserve the battery power for as long as it can. And it'll continue to do its job. It'll, uh, if you get a leak during that time, it'll still run the shutoff. Um, if it'll still meter water, that if water is still going through it. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll continue to do its job. It'll hold off on regenerations and that sort of thing. Um, so I would suggest if somebody's in a situation where they really need, even with power off, to have their system still up and running, that we, they maybe go into a, get a UPS or something more substantial to back up their system. Mm -hmm. But uh, for most installations, most circumstances, the battery backup will take care of that situation for them. Makes sense. Yeah, typically we don't, or when our power does go out, it's not for very long. Yeah. And oftentimes, if they're a well, well, a person who has a well pump, you know, you're not gonna have water anyway to treat right. in that situation, so. Makes sense. This may be our last question. I know last time when I announced that we were on the last question, we got a lot more questions. So this is our last question, unless more questions are texted in to 419-210-5001 while we're answering this question. So Max Feldman uh, <laughs> has asked, we're, we're laughing because we all know and love Max and hear from him frequently. Hey, Max. Uh, if you have multiple service people responsible for a system, how many people can the information be pushed to? Uh, I'm assuming he's talking about the web app. Um, if, if their system needs service. I mean, typically, we envision there only being one service person per system. But do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, we definitely are addressing that. Um, and with the Drop Web app, there is going to be the opportunity to log in uh, as a service person. Um, it, can, it can be handled different ways. Either you have one login for all your service people, or you, you definitely can enter separate accounts for them, and they can log in that way. And there, there really isn't a limit, again, um, if you have Ten service people on your team, they can all have an account, they can all log in and have access to the systems under your company, and that would take care of uh, that need, I, I think, in either case, you know, right. whether they want one account or multiple. Right, right. So you've got, yeah, you've got a, a maybe a large plumbing company or a water treatment dealership. They've got many service people, many trucks. They could have one. Uh, they might each have their own login, but... Yeah. But that Which one on a larger one. operation, I think that would be the ideal way, you know, yeah. to have each one have their own account. Um, but on a smaller operation, it may make sense just to have a single account and not have to worry about logins and multiple yeah. logins. That sort yeah, of that thing. makes sense. Up to them. All right, guys, uh, that's it for today. Anything else you guys want to add before we wrap it up today? All right. Thanks. Be sure to stay tuned. Uh, next month, we've got the Drop Kick live event coming up. So look forward to seeing you there. Thanks. Have a good day. And if there are issues that develop, we'll go through some of the things here that will take a, that could cause the. Hey, how did you like me stumbling on that? Good afternoon. Welcome to Drop's second live event. The response we received from. <clears throat> let's start over. That was kind of loud anyway. I didn't realize that the good afternoon was like. Good afternoon! I'm thinking out loud, this is a piece of paper that I'm reading. It has words on it. 
The ProPlex system handles this flawlessly. Give me back to the, back to ProPlex. Now I got gotcha. you. Test. Yep. I Test. Got you now. Test. Test. Allow myself to introduce. Allow, allow me to introduce myself. Let's just start from the top. All right. Uh, which camera should I be looking at? Sorry. Um, let me fix some lighting really fast. We're gonna wait for Bill. All right. Wave to the cameras. They're all recording. It's like Cheech and Chong. <laughs> That's the third little, time that reference has been made. Rolls out of the van. <laughs> you even got the fast food. This is unnerving. I don't like it.